friends, I'm Nella Leary, Managing Editor here at Busted She, and this is another installment of our Come and See series. So if you didn't know we've been doing these, you can catch them all on our website, on our YouTube, just speaking with incredible women from different communities all around the U.S. about their communities, calling and charism, and, and what that vocation looks like. So I'm here with two of my incredible friends in St. Paul, Minnesota, right here at my parish, at my kids' school, St. Agnes. Ladies, tell us about what order you're part of. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. All that good stuff. We're gonna start with you, Sister Teresa. Okay. Um, my name is Sister Teresa Christie, and I'm a member of the Dominican Sisters of Mary Mother of the Eucharist. And we're out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, but we teach all around the country. And so I'm stationed this year uh, at St. Agnes School in St. Paul to teach um, eighth and 10th grade, and I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. And I've been a sister for 13 years. Any fun facts about you, sister? The, the one I always use is, <laughs> is probably a very recycled, but I, I went to the World Championships for baton for like three times as a child. Wait, so. what? what? <laughs> Slow down. Three times? How did I didn't win, but... I didn't even know there was such a thing. There is such this a thing. This is incredible. Yeah, so. The World Championships yes, for baton twirling. Can it's we true. get a demonstration at the end? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I started when I was three, so... That's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, kind of. Do you there's, there's some restrictions. Are you teaching? Yeah. Well, yeah, with the some... kids, you like they have to earn, earn anything. They, they have, to, have earn. to earn it. Yeah. So it's this time of year that I start kind of bringing that in as you know an attention getter. So. <laughs> <laughs> and remind me, which which grades do you teach? This I teach all, I teach all the tenth graders. Our school is a K through twelve school, so I teach all the tenth graders American history, and then I teach one section of eighth graders, like the second half of Western Civ. Amazing. That's great. Thank you so much, sister. How about you, sister? I'm Sister Maria Carroll, and I am also a sister of the Dominican Sisters of Mary, <laughs> Mother of the Eucharist. And I'm originally from Rolla, Missouri, which is not too far from St. Louis. You're both from Missouri? I did not know that. Yes. yes. I so love that. It is good. And then I'm currently teaching at St. Agnes, first grade. So she has she the older ones, and I have the little ones. And she teaches our third child. Science, is it just science? Science, yes. He's in the other classroom. He loves you, sister. Oh. You play with him at recess? You run around with him? He told me you can run faster than I can. I believe him. <laughs> You're just such a gift. Thank you. It's fun. They keep you young, you know. They, they certainly <laughs> do. Now, what's your fun fact? I don't really think you can beat Sister Teresa Christie. I don't think anybody she's, can beat oh, that. She does actually some good ones. Okay, we're um, ready. Well, I have spent almost every summer of my religious life visiting my family butchering chickens. <laughs> butchering chickens? Yeah, my family decided to just raise and butcher chickens. Raise and butcher chickens? <laughs> yes. Like, yes. Like, like, like you turn them upside down and you, like cut their heads off and you drain the blood and you pluck the... There's a whole process. Oh my! Yes. And everyone has their part. Everyone has their Do job. you have a favorite part of butchering chicken? Oh, I'm quality control with mom in the kitchen. Quality control? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you ladies yeah. have some hidden talent. Yes. I can't believe this. So my 16-year-old brother decided to start this. Okay. When I entered the convent. So then after I entered the convent, like, hey, we, we raised chickens. So I'm the second oldest of eight children, and there's four girls and four boys. So it was like the great... Intro to community wow. life. <laughs> no kidding. You were yes. you prepped. You were ready to go. Yes, yes. So, butchering chickens. I, the time to, you Wow. I should also say, so Sister Marie Carroll, our community, we're very, very blessed to have some CDs. And Sister Marie Carroll is the beautiful soprano voice. That's you. That's Now her. we need more demonstrations. After that. <laughs> what a, what a gift. I knew we should have talked about the show. <laughs> First, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of today, for our life, for our breath. Thank you for being here with us. We ask your special blessings upon this conversation, that it can stir up love and joy, not only in our hearts, but in all of our listeners. For every woman viewing, Lord, who feels a call, who feels your pull in her heart, we ask that you give her extra graces to discern what that is. We ask all this through the intercession of your Blessed Mother as we say, Hail Mary, full, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Agnes, pray for, pray for us. us. Uh, okay, so friends, we would love to hear any questions you have, any comments, anything. Please just jump right into that chat box and we will get back to you with any answers. We really want this to feel like a conversation with you, even though I'm the one who's lucky enough to sit in person with these sisters. We want you to feel like you're just a part of it. Just part of the, what's well, she's sister and part of the family right here, ladies. So starting out with the Ann Arbor Dominicans. Now, I went to law school in Ann Arbor a really long time ago, and I remember the Dominicans being there, and they were... Uh, not, I mean, they're, they're not a super old order, but they weren't that young when I was there. I was there in 2005 to 2008. So tell us about the order itself, about its founding, about about everything. Give us the background. Give us the details. So <laughs> we were founded in 1997 uh, by four sisters who felt John Paul II's call to the new springtime of faith, the new evangelization. Mm. And so... Um, it was a gift of the Holy Spirit from St. Dominic, um, the Dominican spirit. And then with that, um, a special devotion to Our Lady. Yes, I love that. I mean, even your beautiful yes. medals. Yes. We'll give you guys a close-up of these medals. They're so, I mean, that art is just gorgeous. <clears throat> and so as the Blessed Mother, Mother of the Eucharist, um, how Mary brings us to her son, mm -hmm. and um, our community has a devotion to the Eucharist. And every day we spend time in front of him. That's really incredible. So you're founded right there in Ann Arbor mm -hmm. by four sisters. Originally, we were founded in New York, and then we went to Ann Arbor, okay under yeah. John O'Connor. So. Yeah. Okay, okay. So that's where the mother house is. Mm -hmm. And then how many daughter houses are there? Are there daughter houses, or what is it called when you guys go? And we call them mission conscience. Yes. Mission. Yes. Oh, Just like, like going that. like like mm -hmm. this is a mission, like mission territory. Like you are everywhere. mission territory. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I think it's. 14 or 15. Oh my goodness, so many. <laughs> Can't remember. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So every, yeah. Yes. That is so, because anytime I share on social media about the Ann Arbor Dominicans, or even one of our own Blessed She writers that we finally got to get on board, Sister Maria Fatima, if I, if I share a picture, I have so many people from all across the U.S. say, oh my goodness, they were here teaching in California, they were here teaching in Texas, Ohio. I mean, yeah. women that I don't know who say they recognize you, you oh. have it, the beautiful medal. Uh, so, wow, 14 or 15 mission mm -hmm. convents. That's just incredible. Um, and what is... What is the apostolate about? Why are you going out to be missionaries? What is it that you're bringing out into the communities? Well, as Dominicans, our, our charism is to preach and teach the truth. And um, so our main apostolate really is teaching. And I think it's really, it shouldn't be you know, lightly looked at that, like having te sisters teaching the schools is really important. And so that really is our, our primary apostolate. But we're also open to other forms of evangelization as the world is changing. And... Um, and even as education is changing, so when distance learning came out, I mean, we were kind of on board with <laughs> transitioning some things. But one thing that's really come out of that openness to other forms of evangelization is we have a, um, a program called um, Education Virtue. And so we're trying to get that, and it's go doing very well all across the country in different dioceses and schools. And it's, it's a program of teaching the students the kids virtue and the virtues and particular ones and how to grow in virtue. And it's a way of... Um, helping them develop um, that sense of what virtue, what they should be striving for. So we say, you know, we, we tell the kids what not to do, you know, but it's like, actually, this is what you should be doing. God you know? And so, um, and so that's really, I mean, we have it, you know, going K through 12 here at St. Agnes. Um, the entire Diocese of Sacramento does it. So, you know, we're trying to, but wow. it's really been picking up because, you know, it's, we're in such a difficult culture and so many parents and schools are like, how do we, how do we, to help each other, you know what I mean? They're so saturated with, with so much filth. And, mm -hmm. and so we found that to be a way of spreading um, the Dominican charism, which St. Thomas Aquinas very much so wrote about virtue um, in a way that's very accessible to our modern world and accessible to children. And we're trying to make it more accessible to older students as well. I mean, I've read a little bit of the Summa. It's really hard. <laughs> so the fact that you ladies are doing this. Yeah. Well, and I yeah. think the virtue this week was a magnificence. Mm -hmm. Yes. So even to see that, you know, our three school age kids coming home with, this is how they talked about it. We watched a little video, but it was very integrated into the classroom. What a way for the Dominicans mm -hmm. to serve that end of teaching, mm -hmm. but make it be not just limited to your actual physical right. classroom, to have it be 
nation internationally. Yeah. yeah. Globally, yeah. if you will. And homeschool moms can use it too, actually. So we, we also have adaptation mm -hmm. for, for homeschool families too. I love that yeah. so much. Can you tell me a little bit about the mother house? When you guys go there, is it like, <sighs> yeah, yes. <I> just... <laughs> <laughs> We're home. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, now, what is it like? What, what does it feel like? What does it feel like to be in community there? And then you get, do you do, you get sent out in small groups of sisters? Yeah. Is there an average number of sisters that go to different missions? About three, four or six. Three, four yeah, or six. Four six. Um, four six yeah. So what's it like back, back home? Well, it is, it's this being home. Yeah. And um, I know, especially for the sisters, you know, our first introduction really to living the life was spending that week there in discernment, you know, that Tasha right. before entering. And so, um, and for me personally, I remember walking through those doors of that mother house for the very first time in high school, and I just knew it was home. Yeah. So, wow. And so, Sister Rick. <laughs> and you know, so they always say, you know, when someone's looking for their future spouse or for the perfect job or for, you know, they say, oh, I just knew, you know, and, um, you know, it's that pull on the heart that you feel from God, you're like, this is what I've made you for. And so, um, then when you find that home, you know, it is that sense of you feel peaceful, you yeah. feel rested, you feel at home. And then just the joy of seeing the sisters, too. So you're in this space. Yes, you can see everybody. Yes, yes. You're not always together. I'm like, other orders where they're all, it's just, you know, they're all living together in the community. Mm -hmm. You are sent forth. Yeah. Yes. So to go back and see your other sisters. It is. Yes. To be in the chapel, the Mother House Chapel. Which is gorgeous. I mean, I've seen it through live stream when I saw the final profession vows yes. for Sister um, Maria Consolata. It's just a beautiful, yes. beautiful chapel. Yes. So, and I mean, you know, home is where your sisters are. So this is home, the mm -hmm. convent, here with sisters. Yeah. But there's this added element of, you know, final home is heaven. But, you know, the mother house is a place where all the sisters are coming together or larger groups of sisters are coming together. And so there's just heightened joy seeing sisters you haven't seen for a little while, um, seeing, you know, mother of the council, the foundresses, you know, yes. Those because all the foundresses are they all still with us? Yep. Yes. Yeah. And who is it who came? It was your. It was mother. Mother Sumta. Mother, mother Sumta. I remember her coming here to St. Agnes mm -hmm. when she was mm -hmm. scoping it out, and my children. I baked her cookies. <laughs> we saw her once, and then we saw her back. back. Well, we, I was like, you guys have to make cute cards, so they want to come to St. Agnes. <laughs> so we made cookies. They made their cards. Like went up to her after mass. Like, oh here, mother, please come. So what a joy. I'm going to say it was the cookies. It's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, that's why you guys are here. Yeah. No, not at all. <laughs> but how beautiful that she really does discern where you guys are, mm -hmm. where you're called to go. Yeah. Because everybody wants to have teaching sisters, mm -hmm. especially not sisters who are um, relegated simply to teaching about the spiritual life, like specifically right. religion, which is an incredible call. And we need sisters to do that too. But to see sisters teaching the whole spectrum. Um, you all have uh, advanced degrees. Can you talk a little bit about that, about the education process, even within the culture of the, the Dominican Mary Mother of the Eucharist? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, when we enter, you spend three years in the novitiate, so as a postulate, we have two years as a novice. And those years are, are spent, uh, we take classes, actually like three classes a day, um, within the mother house. And, and it's great because we bring in either outside professors, we have Sacred Heart Seminary right there, uh, we have some other kind of people that are resourced in the area as well. And also our own sisters. We have a lot of sisters that have very advanced degrees that are very good at teaching, and they zoom in sometimes <laughs> from other places. Um, and so, you know, we, we take classes in scripture and in philosophy and Mariology. And, and, mm -hmm. and also, like, not just in those things, but, like, like in the Dominican order, too. Like, what, what, what does it mean to be a Dominican? Um, you know, Dominican spirituality. Um, you know, St. Catherine of Siena and, and her writings and like, you know, in, in really imbibing the spirit and the, and the so, charism. Yeah. I mean, amazing. Um, and, and it also, I think it's also important that as a postulant, we have a class just on the catechism because we have so many young women and I was one of them for sure that, that were, it was like halfway catechized, you know what I mean? Like, and so we have to make sure that everybody comes in actually, do we really know everything, you know, about, I mean, like first things first, you know, and I, that really struck me as a postulant actually that there wasn't this assumption that like everybody... Um, you know, you know, had a doctor in philosophy or something like that. So <laughs> then it was like, let's all just be on the same level. Like, do we, have we all totally read the catechism? You know, have we all, have we all read Vatican II documents? You know, mm -hmm. so do we actually understand what those say? And so um, that that really struck me. You know, as a postulant, just this attention to um, where everybody was. I think. I love that. Um, and and I was one of the ones that was half catechized by all means. And then um, and then. Um, 
so we, yes, we take classes, and, but they're all aimed at really our formation. Mm -hmm. um, they're not aimed at any sort of advanced degrees. Or it's, it's really just aimed at like you um, learning the life and, and coming deeper into knowledge and love of God. And that's really what our, our classes are as, an, as a, um, a, a postulant and a novice. And then if you already have a teaching degree, which actually pretty rarely, uh, we have sisters that come in with any sort of teaching degree. <laughs> um, I did not want to be a teacher at all. Actually, sister, I had, you're such a natural. I had, I had dropped out of a teaching program. No, <laughs> no, you're Although, such a natural. Those, those credits transferred quite well. But, um, so we have very few, actually, you know, that, um, so, but after you make first profession, um, if you already, are, already have a teaching degree, then you probably would be sent out. But for the most part, we don't. And so in temporary vows, you know, two or three years of that time is spent um, just obtaining a teaching degree. And we send sisters to a couple different places right now. Um, but I know for us, at least when we were in, you know, we, we went to secular universities. We, we, public, we uh, student taught in public schools. Uh, we did all of our observations in public schools. And so, I mean, I mean, the evangelization opportunity there, you know, had its limits because we couldn't talk about it, but it just was. I, I mean, mean, we just, yes. were, you know. Just looking a little it just was. different. Yes. So we, we all have incredible stories actually from those times wow. was, was being in the public schools as sisters. Um, and like it's not, in a lot of ways it's not ideal, but it is what God has asked. Like it's, it's what's happened for us and that's what God wants. Like, um, and that God wants us to kind of spend that time um, in those environments, even though they aren't necessarily that helpful maybe for actually teaching in a Catholic classroom. It's, it's just really us being there for the kids and learning a couple things too. And then, um, and then after you get your teaching degree, likely you would be sent out to teach, but we're very blessed as Dominicans. There's such an emphasis on, on, on just study and that the study, not just for the sake of, of kind of gathering knowledge or gathering degrees or something like that. It's, it's you know, studying because it, you know, as you learn more about um, God or God's world, um, that, helps helps your prayer and it also helps you in the apostolate too and so um so we we all really i mean do get advanced degrees and in, in various things and um also not just in a lot in theology obviously in philosophy but not just in those two um like i i was sent to get a master's in american history and you know i was like the sister that was studying american <laughs> history <laughs> oh, I'm like, there you go you know and so there you go. um but I mean, it was it was a huge privilege, you know, to 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 enter into that sort of learning and to be able to bring that then to the classroom and to be able to bring a certain level of knowledge and expertise into, but also that you bring you don't just bring that into the classroom. I mean, that would not be enough, you know. You, I, I mean, I, I think about when I teach history, that I'm really teaching about humanity and what it means to be human, mm -hmm. you know. And so I, I think I, I I think because of our our charism and, and your consecration as a sister. You know, you're able to open up some of these um, subjects in a deeper way than than maybe than maybe other people can, maybe not but but you are I think I think I'm able to open up some things and and show them um, history in maybe a different way um, because it comes more from my prayer and um, yeah but we're very very blessed with with that level of learning but it's not utilitarian it's it's really right. supposed to be for ourselves and um, for our own prayer but then also that that's a gift that we give to others. Oh, I love that. Well, that segues right into the next question, which is about your own personal journeys into this. Um, the American history. Yeah. Was that always something that you were interested in? I mean, yeah, how, yeah, I mean. Were they like, ah, American <laughs> yeah, history, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Japanese, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to get a PhD in science, you pull yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, how, how did, well, I love to hear both of your journeys, but that is a particularly interesting thing. Yeah. You know, it was a cult, kind of cultivating something you already. Right. I, I had a bachelor's in history already. Okay from before I entered, and so um, I think that was just, just kind of coming off of that, yeah. so, yeah. So, how did you first get introduced to the Ann Arbor Dominicans, kind of what, how did it all unfold in front of you? Um, for me? Yeah. So, I, uh, I grew up in St. Louis, and I grew up, I was in a family that, I wouldn't say we sat around and talked about the Summa, or <laughs> there was Who's the, the like, that? that's amazing. The, like, the dogmatic <laughs> approach was not our family's approach, but um, definitely a family, though, that prayed, and where the faith was, was seriously talked about, and, and lived, and we never missed Mass, and, like, this was very important, and um, so that, that was talked to me as a young age, like, this is very important. And I also saw it lived in my parents, like that they were very, um, they were just really good people, and but not ostentatious in any way, shape, or form. And um, 
And then, and I also would say another big thing looking back is that I've really learned the faith um, from the lives of the saints. I just love the lives of the saints. I think it was part of why I love history so much, actually, was, was I just loved, like, this, that these people really existed and, yes. and, and that they were people of and their lots time. Lots of personality. Yeah, Tons. different personality. <laughs> the, the whole gamut. The whole gamut. <laughs> they, were shaped, yeah. they were shaped by their time. Yes. You know, and that, yes. that their time, you know, influenced, like, all sorts of things in their life. And so I, I think that was a big part of me, like, in history, too, and, um, but it was really the lives of the saints. So I'd say in a lot of ways that they really um, catechized me. And, and I remember like looking at a picture of like St. Sebastian as a kid and thinking like, that's the real deal. All those you know? arrows. Yeah, All those like, arrows. I was like, ugh. You know, and so I, I, I had real like, I had real thoughts about, you know, I, you yeah. know am I up to par with it? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was, it, yeah, so I had a lot of those sort of thoughts. And I went to Catholic school and, um, and I had like a really difficult class in, in Catholic school and, and it was it was good challenge in a lot of ways of, of my own tests and, and virtue and, and standing up for what was right and things like that. Um, when I was in seventh grade, I got to see Pope John Paul II when he came to St. Louis. And so I had like the John Paul II experience that everybody, you know, yes. um, talks about. And so I was there for his famous line, you know, uh, Christ is calling you, the church needs you, the Pope believes you and expects great things for you. And so I was there for that. And, you know, I had experience of like nobody else there except for me and him, you know, like wow. the classic moment. And, and I, so I knew I was called a religious life. I was also very blessed in growing up in St. Louis. I saw a lot of religious. Mm. Um, that it wasn't a super foreign no, concept. No, it wasn't a foreign concept. We had sisters in school that were in the habit that left after first grade. Okay. So I had their memory. But, but there, there were definitely just sisters around because St. Louis is like a huge hub. So, um, so I, knew, I, knew that I knew what this was. Yeah. You know, and plus I li- read so much about the lives of the saints. Mm. So, but I also was like very practical. So I was like, well, <laughs> kind of like, like your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said to myself, I was like, well, I still have to go to high school. You know, I, like, I was like, yeah. <laughs> what's next? Yeah, I was like, what's to next? go to high school. So I kind of tucked that away in my heart. And, um, and then I uh, received confirmation that year from Cardinal Regali, actually, and, and had like a real kind of experience of the Holy Spirit and a real kind of sense of calling. Um, but again, I was like very practical. I was like, hey, go to high school, you know. Yeah. But I, but it was very real, and I, I knew that was very real, and and I had senses of like, that as a child too. I think I, I wrote down on some like, what do you want to grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? She like, I want to be a missionary. Like I had that kind of sense as a kid. Uh, but I also was a very normal child. I was actually, <laughs> I was actually quite naughty, and um, there's hope. I was, her. I was Our not. Children. Like my my older sister was like the perfect. I like, I was not. Yeah, I, I was not well behaved in a lot of ways. So yeah, I got suspended from school in fifth grade and things like that. So yeah, I was not well behaved. But but I, I had this kind of confl- I had this kind of conflicting you know like life. I mean I, I was kind of a lot of ways even from a very young child kind of torn between the world and torn between what what I between the life of faith and a real life of faith and 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 how countercultural that was. And I, so I, from a very young age, I felt that pull. Mm. And so I kind of teetered back and forth in a lot of ways from a very young age um, in those things. And I was very much immersed in the world. And I mean, I, you know, very, very much a normal kid of the time. And so, uh, so I went to high school. I went to an all-girls Catholic high school, and I loved it. It was great. I had great experience. I had great friends. And I, looking back on that, like, how, you know, how important I think, you know, all these people watching this know how important good friends are, you know? And, and so I had really good friends. And... We went to youth group and we went to Steubenville conferences and and also so I had a really good like high school experience in a lot of ways and just a lot of great opportunities to grow and all that kind of stuff and um, when I was a junior I met a young woman who was entering a convent she was a year older than me right entering right out of high school wow. and and she blew my mind because she was so normal yes and that's huge yes <laughs> I think that's huge yeah <laughs> to know that the religious are you are my sister? So yeah, normal people. Yeah, so so because I, I had this cooked up idea, this sort of people I thought entered convents, and I was like, oh wow, I'll never fit in. They already levitate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like weird or something. So, so I, I, so I asked like a million questions and probably very embarrassing questions, but I asked a million questions, and and again, she was just so real, and so I, I, I couldn't get over the fact that she was entering without going to college. Yeah. Um. That that blew my mind because in my family, like you went to college, and so and she and she just was like, what. But if, if God's calling me now, I go now. And I, and I remember hearing her say that, that made so much sense wow. that I, like, it, it actually scared me how much sense it made. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, that, like, God was so much above kind of our own little paths, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, 
I went with her and I visited her community and another community nearby. They're very, very good communities. I would recommend them. But when I went there, I, I just wanted to leave. Didn't feel it. No, I didn't feel it all. And, and I also, I, I don't think I was really mature enough to kind of understand the, their life either. Um, but I... I walked away from that experience thinking I maybe would, didn't have vocation because mm -hmm. I, I I was good I was very practical so I knew like these were good communities they made up they right. checked up all these like things like they're good communities they have young sisters in them they are in St Louis my hometown mm -hmm. you know what I mean like they 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 fit kind of all these lists and um and and so I walked away thinking maybe I didn't have vocation and so I was a little kind of confused and but I but I knew I did anyway so then going in my senior year of high school. Um, it was a, like the devil really works in busyness, and I think we all know that. But I, you know, it's like he really does, and he works by um, getting us very, very distracted and, and all that. So my senior year, I was very distracted. I was very busy, too busy, and I didn't really understand that that was a problem because mm. I was like the first time that ever happened in my life, I think. And um, and then some like little drama went down in my youth group, and so I I walked away by the end of my senior year thinking that. I didn't really need community. Like, I didn't really need mm -hmm. faith community. That I kind of knew how to do this, like, faith thing. I had figured out. Yeah, and I don't really need these other people. <laughs> I don't need these other people that cause drama. Yeah. You know? People so, cause drama. People cause drama. So, I'm just not going to have people. You know? So, I'm, <laughs> anyway. So, so I... Very I, logical. Yeah. It made, it all made sense. It's it's all, all definitely from the devil. So, I went into college very, very vulnerable and with that kind of mentality. And I, I had no idea if I went to a nationally ranked party school. Um, I had no idea what that meant. And I fell into that, that scene vi like right away. And all of a sudden I was in with like an older group of people. And all of a sudden I was really cool. And I was like, like, like I knew deep down I wasn't cool. Sister! <laughs> and I was like, how am I cool? And I was like, this cool thing's really dumb. And I knew it was, but I kept, but I didn't, I had made this facade on myself that, that I, I didn't really know how to backtrack. Um, so it was through a series of events, though, that, that God really kind of broke me open and, and also really caused me to see, and it was a huge moment of growing up, and I think everybody has to come to this, hopefully earlier than later, um, of realizing like, I had made all my own bad choices mm -hmm. and that I could blame nobody for any of my bad choices, but also that I knew that I knew who God was. I knew that God was very merciful and that like it was, I wasn't done for. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like I did a lot of dumb things that a lot of people did. You know, so yeah. I was just like... So I was like, oh, I just need to go to confession. You know what I mean? Like, you're so lucky. And just like, it's true. Uh, you can really, like, I had, I had that much of an understanding of the faith to know that, like, that's all I needed to do. Yeah. And that, like, and that a new beginning was really possible. Mm. So that, that came to me. And what, what came after that was really difficult because I, I really had to try to make new friends. I never was really able to. And that was because the environment I was in, it's just people were just not on the same page. Yeah. And so, um, that was really good for me because I had always, I had grown up my whole life being very popular and always having friends and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and so, um, like to have this experience, it was really kind of a dark night and it was really purifying and very good for me. Um, because I had to kind of face myself Yes, you without busy. kind of, you yeah, without kind stuff. of all my yeah. little other things and all my little ego trips and all sorts, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it was really good for me. Um, it was very hard, but it was very good for me. And so I really spent the last two years of college just, just praying and just like wow, going to class and like you know I, I I had some friend you know I'm here but nothing really ever that was anything really substantial and I had some good friends back at home still which was helpful because you have to have some people what you're yeah. <laughs> yeah. but like um but yeah it was really good and and so then I I really found our community um looking at the internet and what did you look up um, I don't remember. Something like the something, the internet kind of helped. Yeah, take bad places, but can take you good places. Right, yeah. kind of fell into the right. So place. I had I had kind of a spiritual director at the time that was a Dominican sister, and she recommended. She, I think she had seen. She, she knew about our community or something. So so I think that was part of it. I don't exactly remember, but I went on the website and I reading. I was like, I think this is what I'm called to. And also talking to the sister that had been Dominican. I realized that like I that that charism was kind of more for me, um, and I was never the Dominican saints were never saints that I was primarily attracted to actually. Mm -hmm. So I, I had never really thought about Dominicans, and so um, and then I visited, and once I really visited, and and that's really key. I think I think for advice for young women, you know, you have to go out and visit places. You know, you can like tool around on the internet all you want, and you can think about things all you want, but you actually have to go out. And, and go and meet communities and go and visit them. And going on comes and sees and stuff like that are actually not 
they're not like you're signing, you know, your life away on the right. on the dial line. It really is actually very <laughs> informal, and that we see it that way too. And so, um, so going and visiting actually our community, and going on retreat, and and like the sister was saying, you know, going into the mother house, and I just had a sense that I was home, and that I could, I knew, I felt like I knew all the sisters. I thought like I could remember all their names, and I just, I just didn't want to. I just knew that I was home, and wow, um, and then the funniest story. And I, I never really asked God for signs or anything like that, but this was really funny. I don't remember asking for a sign, but it's just funny. I was on the airplane going back, and I had my application papers like in my bag, and I sat down next to this woman, and she started telling me all about how she'd been in Albi, France, and how she was talking to Albigensians, and she like was going on and on. And so if you know anything about the, the history Goodness. of the Dominicans, is that St. Dominic founded the Dominicans to combat this... Um, old heresy, which is still around in some other ways, um, called the Albig- called Albigensianism, and, and like you know, like people believe in Albigensianism, but they don't say I'm an Albigensianist. <laughs> and so wow. the woman actually was telling me she was an Albigensian. So you're like, here's my application. I know. So, so she, was, and she was going on and on. I just I just stared ahead and I just thought to myself, Saint Dominic, I've never prayed you before, but I'm sitting next to an Albigens. <laughs> So that, I mean, that was very confirming. Oh so that's my wow. story. That's incredible. No, no, it's not long at all. It's not long at all. Yeah. Um, that's really remarkable. And you touched on this. We touched on it at the beginning, but again, to flesh out kind of the charism, because the Dominicans do have the contemplative and the Yes, active, yes. Which I should have said at the beginning, because yes. I didn't know about you guys. But it's mm-hmm. an interesting thing that not, or, not all orders have that. Right. I mean, you're either, you know, you're behind the great, you're mm-hmm. Carmelite, you're behind the great, or you're out... Missionaries are sure you're out right. doing, but it's a very interesting yes. blend for you ladies. Mm-hmm. It's a very particular, I think it's great. Well, St. Dominic knew we needed balance. Yes, <laughs> yeah. amen. You know, and, but, but for us to, you know, we do have an active apostolate going out to, to teach the truth, to be in the classroom, um, to help those who are intellectually, spiritually poor. Mm-hmm. But if we're not grounded, then we give nothing, you know? Yes. And mm-hmm. there's that classic, you know, contemplate and then give to others the fruits of your contemplation from St. Thomas Aquinas. Brilliant. Hashtag brilliant, of course, <laughs> of everything you said. Way to go St. Thomas. Yeah. yeah. So, and then also you just, you really can't give what you don't have. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. You know, and yeah. so you have to go to the well spring in order to bring, mm. you know, be God's instrument. So. And, but for you, sister, so you walked, you did a comedy in high school. Yes. And you walked in and thought, I think this is it. I mean, what? How did you even find out about them, though? Again, you're right. down in Missouri. Right. I know. I mean, Missouri is not that far from Michigan, like a state in between, maybe. I don't know. Geography is a little rusty. Don't tell my kids. Uh, <laughs> but how did you even find out about it? Well, I actually first started about thinking. First started thinking about religious life at five years old. Five years old. Oh my goodness. And if I go back, I re- my first memory was I was in kindergarten. And my dad was in the Air Force, so we moved around quite a bit, and it was a great adventure. It always, it was always so great to see new places, to meet new people. And um, I remember we were getting ready to move from the Air Force base, and I was in kindergarten. So of course, you know, they do it all about me, you oh, know, like yes. share about you before you, you move on, things. you know. Yes. And so I remember um, putting for what do you want to be when you grow up, and I put I want to be a nun and a ballerina. It's a great combination, you know. And <laughs> the, the, the ballerina thing came and okay. left. All right, all right. All right <laughs> but the nun right. thing the came and stayed. Oh, <laughs> sister, I love that. And so, but you felt that so early. Yes, yeah. and you know, as a military family, we moved around, and so um, depending on what state we were in or what Catholic community was there, mm-hmm. wherever we were, um, you know, it varied, and so. Um, but in a way, it was almost like, well, we knew we were home when we we were at the we were at, found our parish, you know. Oh, I love that. Yes. And that was a beautiful gift that I knew about the Catholic the church being universal. Um, but I remember seeing sisters here and there, kind of peppered throughout my life, and just always having a great attraction to them and a desire to be with them. Yeah. And so as I got older. Um, I also remember a moment in middle school. I was helping my dad shred papers in his office. That was my little job. So I'm like shredding all those papers, you know. And my dad at one point, he looks over at me and says, hey, do you want to look at this? He handed me a direct mail from our community. 
No. And really? he's like, he's like, I can't, I can't give, you know, I can't support them financially right now, but I can't me. shred it. So <laughs> yeah. So oh he passed it to me. And so I, I looked at this envelope and I'm going to admit, I didn't even look inside of it. I just looked at the envelope and there were these pictures of all these sisters on the front. It's like, wow, that's so cool. And then, no, the caption was a different kind of vocation crisis. So basically, like, so many women yeah, want our to community versus a different. Yes. So that was like my first time ever setting eyes on our community. Oh my gosh, is it, that's amazing. In middle school. Yes. In middle school. Yes. God plants these little seeds. He does. You know, all these little seeds through our stories. He does. It's really incredible. And so, fast forward to high school, you know, the busyness, sister mentioned, you know, the devil works in the busyness. You know, I lived a very active, very, um, full high school life um I lived I had three homes my house which actually I was at less <laughs> I, the church yeah. and then the theater oh my goodness yeah for so, dance in particular um, or musicals theater. no acting Music, the musicals. singing the soprano oh my goodness wow. you know so that was everything you know yeah. and then friends and yeah. you know choir singing dancing you know just mm -hmm. and so um but still anytime I was praying or at adoration or at mass or singing at mass or um anytime I went on a march for life trip or studentville youth conference mm -hmm. I'd see a sister and then there was that tug you know and then as I got older it, it only got stronger so even yeah. though you know in high school you think oh what what do you want me to do with my life God you know yeah. um all these pools in different directions you know friendships relationships um what are you going to do when you grow up what are you going to go to college mm -hmm. um how are you going to, you know, make a name for yourself right, right. on the stage of life, you know? Stage of life. <laughs> Spoken like a true thespian. <laughs> very, very poignant. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, um, and so it just was very convicting. Just mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, especially the later high school years, I remember seeing a sister and, like, making a beeline to them, wow. wanting to go and just see them. Yeah. And then I remember one time I was with one of my friends, and she... She thought I probably was going crazy because we were at this stupid youth conference. I saw these Franciscan sisters, and I was like, oh, they are so beautiful. And I just started crying, and she's like, you lost my marbles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there was you this. You were so moved. Mm -hmm. I was attracted, yes. Yeah, very, very attracted. Charming. And so um, I was confirmed as a junior in high school, okay. which is, you know, later than a lot of people. But yeah. um, very similar to sister, mm -hmm. I remember going back to the pew mm -hmm. after being anointed and I just started weeping tears of joy wow. and like I just knew I remember saying to myself my thought was Lord you could send me to Timbuktu and I would go oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's your you word know? Timbuktu is but I'll go Lord. <laughs> exactly yeah. but just like and just the grace of the sacraments um yeah. are you know a strengthening of your God-given vocation and yeah. so um after, you know, that day, I just remember thinking, I, I'll do whatever you want. Now, it wasn't easy. It was not easy, you know, especially since the nun thing's not very popular. And most people are not expecting you to open your mouth and say, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about religious life. No. Yes, shell-shocked is how yeah. a lot of people yes. are. But thankfully, I mean, I mean, I did have a lot of friends who, who weren't Catholic, a lot of people I knew. But I also had um, a lot of great Catholic families that were friends with my family, um, good Catholic friends, you know, and so, you know, help you along the way. And um, I'm so grateful. My family, we never missed Sunday Mass. Mm -hmm. um, we knew that the faith was important. Mm -hmm. um, and that was so stabilizing. Yes, you especially with all the moving. Exactly, yes. exactly. So that was my junior year of high school, wow. was um, confirmation. And then an exact year later, so I was confirmed on Pentecost. Sunday, which mm -hmm. is, you know, usually it's whenever the bishop can come, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, I like to say, like, double. <laughs> <laughs> double outward. Like, yeah, exactly. Both bells were open. Know, like, on yeah, Pentecost yeah, Sunday. Yeah. But um, through God's providence, you know, different young women that I knew when I would go to discernment retreats or weekends or nun rides, yeah, yeah. Um, an exact year later, on Pentecost Sunday, I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I was saying, yep, this is it. And it just felt right. Yeah, it was right. So, yeah. and he, I was here in high school, though. So, yeah. you know, part of me was thinking, you know, I talked to the vocation director, Sister Joseph Andrew, and I kind of laid it all out. Like, I really think this, I know this is what I'm made for. Mm -hmm. um, this really feels like home. Yeah. But, I'll, and I told this, I was like, I'll go to college. Just tell me what you want me to study. <laughs> 
Oh. You can jump on that. Yeah, because you can jump on, you know, and I mean, I was looking for the most Catholic college I could think of. Yeah. The one that would, yeah. you know, like, help you with your debt if you were going to enter right. religious right. life. Like, right. I already had it. And right. so I said, but I'll go to college first. Just tell me what you want me to study, yeah. and then yeah. and then I'll enter. And I was shocked by what Joseph Andrews said. She said, well, you don't have to have a college degree. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of something I thought was a prerequisite. You know, for some yes. communities it is. Yeah. And she looked at me and she said, if this is where God's calling you, and you know this is home, mm. why, why would you wait? And oh, that summer thing, like, why are you going to put this on hold? Yeah. Exactly. Why are you put this on hold if this is where he's you know, coming? And it was kind of like, you know, like, you saw the whole film of your life, you know, like, from the moment you were five, and then, like, everything, like, all these little moments, like, yeah, like and it just God's providence in this, like, stream of just mm. grace. And then leading up to this, it felt like it led up to this moment, and I said, I wouldn't wait. So, fine, was, not right, my daughters don't have to go to college and go right <laughs> to set it in Michigan in a couple of years. But it was, it was so, you know, and I think um, what was so beautiful was, that was, you know, May, and I entered in August. And so those months of the summer, you know, like there's all of that, um, you know, the kind of facing, this is what God is asking of me. And then, you know, with anything he asks, whether it's, you know, marriage vocation, priesthood, religious life, anything. There's always going to be sacrifices. Yes. But I think what was so convicting was um, I I had a glimpse and I knew, like, what he wanted. And so those months, and people saying, why are you throwing your life away? Why are you doing right. this? That why whole summer after this? senior year is when everyone's asking, what are you doing? Exactly. Oh, you doing what? Exactly. <laughs> and so, but there was no lack of peace. Mm. And for someone who's a people pleaser and, like, you know, doesn't, you know, you know, it's very much indecisive right. or likes to make sure doing the right thing. Like, there was none of that. And that's, that's total supernatural grace. Supernatural grace. Yeah, exactly. Really cool. And I think that's what was such a gift to experience, um, to have that full freedom to know this is God's yes. will, you know? Yeah. And then you enter, you know, and you live the life and you're strengthened in it. And then there's years of discernment, you know, after you enter. Right. That's so, right. There's a long word ahead of you. You don't, right. exactly. you don't finalize this. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we, we'll get to that in a little bit later. But yeah. that is very beautiful that there is there is a development along the way and, and continually checking in and saying, like, is this still where you want me, Lord? Yes. Is this still where you yes. want me? Yes. And it, it eliminates a lot of fear because a lot of people think, oh, I have to know exactly. I have to have everything laid out. I have to have right. all the plans in order. Um, you know, where am I going to college? What am I going to yeah. study? What am I going to do after college? And um, it just isn't that way. It's not. <laughs> Even if you think it is, it's, it's not. not. It's, and then, it's just not. Exactly. It's and, no, then, it's just not. <laughs> and I, you know, St. Catherine of Siena says, you know, the biggest um, obstacle we face is fear. Mm-hmm. You know, and John Paul II says, be not afraid. And yeah. so the, the church, you know, has religious communities lay out, you know, a whole, you know, process of discernment. So that you don't have to be afraid and you can like freely say, for all my life, I am going to live this life, you know? Yes, yes. And there's a lot of joy and freedom that comes from that. That's so incredible. Wow, ladies, you have great stories. Whew. Well, I think that the beauty of, of your community especially is this focus on the Eucharist. Is this real sense of Mary, mother of the Eucharist. It's not Mary, mother of Jesus, comma. Remember, he's the Eucharist. Mary, mother of the Eucharist. And talking about the graces from confirmation, that strengthening, that resolve yes. from baptism. Um, can you share share with the ladies a little bit about, you know, personally for you, what the Eucharist means in your life, and then about how the community lives out this call? Because it is a huge part of it, in your day, every single solitary day. Who wants to go first? Who's in the hot seat? Well, <laughs> So we, we make a Eucharistic Holy Hour every day, and um, and also have a devotion in making visits to the Blessed Sacrament too. And that's something we try to teach the students too that you, you go when you you make a visit that He's really there, you know, and that you know this isn't you don't just it's not just like a Sunday thing or something. So um, that's something we're cultivated in as, as sisters, but also try to teach the students too that that He really is present, um, you know, in the tabernacle in the Eucharist. Um, you know, in, in this chapel or in, in wherever you are. So that's, I think that's so important to, you know, people are so lonely, you know, and, and our, our kids, the students are very lonely. And for, for them to realize that, you know, that there's this abiding presence of God mm-hmm. everywhere throughout the world. Yeah. Um, and, and that's very powerful. And, and so we have to teach, you know, there's so many Catholics that don't really understand the Eucharist. And um, that's something we so have to teach. So for us, you know, making that Holy Hour every day, 
um, you know, it's, it's at 5.30 in the morning, you know, and, you know, I mean, you're like still getting the sleep yeah. out of your eyes. Oh, no, no, but, break me up, uh, break know, me but, up. But, you know, but you don't want to sleep through it. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's really, you know, um, is that this is really the, the time of, of strengthening, you know, you for the battle of the day. Mm. And, um, and that he really is there present. It's amazing how fast the time can go by. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and then he, you know, we have so many ways of, of praying him, you know, with, with praying with scripture and praying also with Our Lady. I think that's a big part of, of you know, asking Our Lady, like, teach me how, how to adore most perfectly, you know, or, you know, in times of struggle or something like that, to invite Our Lady into your prayer. Um, and your rosary is all, yes. it's how many decades? We have 15 on I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. Right. We have 15. 15. it'd be 15. hard to give 20 on there, but yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, you get the whole yeah. rosary. Yes. Yes. I remember the whole rosary. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes we do pray the rosary before the Blessed Sacrament, too. And, um, but I, I mean, it. I, the older, I don't know, the longer I've been doing this, it, the simpler it kind of is. You know what I mean? Like, you just, you know, with St. John Vianney, you say, you know, you just, yeah. sometimes you're just there looking at him and he's looking at you, and you're just like, I'm really glad that I don't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> because maybe your heart's so full that you actually, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, there aren't really words for it. Um, mm-hmm. Or you are full of distraction and weakness in the moment. You know what I mean? And you're like, this is what I got. You yeah. know, like, you, know, you should bring everything before him. You know, you bring all your junk before him. You bring all, you know, like. Don't yeah, sort. You know? Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, ask him to to help you in, in challenges. And, and mm-hmm. yeah, so it's just that. It, I think, I don't know, just very simple in a lot of ways. I don't really have anything really profound. It's actually just very simple. But it's a huge gift, you know, that, um, that, we, that we have in the Eucharist. And, and we, have, we can never forget that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're so blessed with the daily um, Eucharistic adoration. I love that. Yes. How is it for you, Sister? Um, I've taught second grade many years. And so preparing them for receiving First Holy Communion yes. <laughs> has been a gift for me. Because yeah. you go through, like, the effects of Holy Communion, um, you go through what does the Eucharist mean, um, and so you know so over several years of repeating those things over and over, you know, you realize this is really true. Um, but also just the fact that I love um, a quote of John Paul II: "The Eucharist is the secret of my day." Oh, the secret of my day, and that's beautiful. And that is kind of how it is for us because it's early morning. Exactly. You know, Often in Minnesota, it's dark. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. From, <laughs> till like eight a.m. Exactly. Yeah. But it's just like hidden time. Yes, yeah. and just, just with him. Exactly, and like mm-hmm. being able to cherish sharing the love for the Eucharist with students, you realize it really is a secret of my day. You know, yeah. um, and it's it is like Sister said, it's very simple. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> I have to say, you know. Sometimes it can be hard to be in the classroom teaching the little ones and... No kidding! <laughs> and, I don't know how you ladies do it. You know, Especially the little ones. And so Sorry. just knowing that, you know, he's filled you up and yeah. he's still right there and you can say, Jesus, give me patience out loud right then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking his prayer, Lord. And, you know, and, um, but yeah, he's, he's just the secret of the day. Mm. And I think what's beautiful is... Um, as a sister, God's given me so many moments to know that he, it's all him, you know, mm-hmm. but like he has chosen to make us a sign to others. Yes. And so knowing that I'm armed with the strength of the Eucharist, I can like pinpoint whether someone in the airport or another sister or a parent or someone I teach with, like being able to like tangibly bring them some comfort or to tangibly mm. bring them some hope or joy <laughs> yes. throughout the day. Yes. And it's not me, it's the Eucharist. Because like Mother Teresa says, you become a living tabernacle. Yes. You know, and yes. so um, if you if you have if you have sometimes you know God opens your eyes and you can see those tangible moments where you really were a living tabernacle to mm. someone with even if when you didn't really realize it. Right. The Holy Spirit's prompting you and you're kind of bumping up against yeah. itself and you know subconsciously. Exactly. And then to think, oh, I really, I was that moment Jesus worked through me, that principle of subsidiary mm-hmm. that's so important that he's working through us. Mm-hmm. Well, we don't know. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's like Christ. Yeah. That's really beautiful. So when you're all together at the mother house, mm-hmm. then Eucharistic adoration must be pretty special when yeah. everybody gets yeah. to do it together. Mm-hmm. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I love that. And then in your day here, how, how you, having that contemplation and having that activity uh, are the contemplative parts of the day all in the morning, or how do you guys do? You have, what's the schedule like? 
So the, the morning we make the holy hour with the Eucharistic adoration, and then also morning prayer. So we so we chant also the liturgy of the hours, and so that's a very Dominican so monastic thing beautiful. that we chant. So great. And so that's something we also have to learn information too a little bit. Um, but then you know then we go to mass, and another big part of our contemplative life would be that we eat our meals in silence, oh, that's right. and with with usually some kind of reading at table. Um, and the refectory where we eat is actually considered kind of like a second chapel. Uh, we keep mm-hmm. silence in the refectory. It's in the cloister. Uh, we chant back and forth the prayers, just as if we would up in the chapel. And um, so it's a place of silence. Um, it's also a place of recreation on solemnities, you know. But um, so that's another way that that um, I think is very unusual for people to think that we, you, you eat. Because usually eating is a time of... It's the time when you come you chat, here. Yeah, right. but it's, it's also, it's another time we see that to be fed um, on the word. Um, and so that's another way our contemplative life was lived. Um, and then we also have periods of silence throughout the day. Now, it's a little bit different when you're teaching because we were in our classroom by 7.30 in the morning. Um, but like on Saturdays, um, usually the mornings on Saturdays are all silent, unless it was a particular feast day. Um, usually Sunday mornings are all silent. Um, it's a little bit longer even in the novitiate is to cultivate that spirit of silence. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not the first one to say this, that we're in a noisy world, you know, and, yes, that, no and that it, it really <laughs> it distracts people from, from knowing how, I think from facing themselves. Yes. You know, it's so easy just to like cling to some sort of device or to whatever mm-hmm. and, um, and to not really face yourself and whatever you need to see in yourself, but also to cultivate that that interior cell that St. Catherine talks about, you know, that, that you can't always be in the chapel, you know, I mean, like, we can't, you know, we, we, you know, we're in the classroom, and we're, you know, and so, but to always have that, that cell that's been built inside of yourself, you, that you retreat to, and, and, and speak to him, and know that he's, he's present within you, and that can only be cultivated in, in, in silence, and I think that's what, what St. Paul talks about when he, when he says to pray always, you know, and it always perplexes me, because you're like, but I have to think about other things, <laughs> Out of obligation, I have to think right. about other things. You know? Right. So, like, what what does he mean? I, I think that he's talking about that that interior space that you can retreat to, and 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 you know, and walking down the hall, or walking to the coffee machine, or whatever. That that you're like, oh yes, the Lord is present within me, and you know, kind of to settle your yourself, or whatever. Um, so that that you can only cultivate that, which is so necessary uh, for everyone. Uh, through through some sort of silence, and yeah, so so we have extra a lot of silence yeah. wow. more than a lot of other people can. Yeah, um, and then then we also we pray again um, after school, uh, vespers and the rosary, um, and then we eat dinner again usually in silence. And then uh, another thing that's key about the Dominican life in particular is recreation. You guys are like yeah. card sharks. Yes, like serious card players. Yes, <laughs> like serious. You know your game. Yes, <laughs> so. <laughs> that, one thing that struck me as a postulate was that we were told that you actually had to ask permission to not be at recreation. Really? And, and that still strikes me, you know, because, yeah. you know, everybody has a propensity to be a workaholic. Yes. Mm-hmm. Everybody does. Even sisters. Everybody does. And so you're, there's always more to do. Yes, I mean, she's a teacher. Yeah. Yes. Like, yes. like yes. there's always more to do. Nothing's ever, you know, completely as it is. <laughs> so, um, so... So to realize how serious it is to, to live a life of balance is actually worked into our life that there's like a mandatory hour of like playtime, you know, um, it's really healthy actually. And that you would actually have to ask not to be there, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, which sometimes, you know, there are reasons, but like, but usually there's not. So, um, that always really struck me. And so we have that in the, in the afternoon or the evening, which is recreation. And then we pray Compline and we end, um, but we have spiritual reading too. So we're always trying to read you know, reading some kind of spiritual book to, to nourish our prayer, and um, which is such a privilege, you know, it just, I think about all the, all the books now that I've read, you know what I mean, just yeah. from that time, I mean, like, yeah, you know, um, and then Compla, which is night prayer, and Compla's really special to the Dominicans, because Our Lady um, said that after Compla, she asked the Dominicans to sing the Salve Regina, and to process to her um, statue, and that she, she said that during a certain part of the Salve Regina, that she would always prostrate herself before our Lord, asking for intercession for the Dominican order. And so we kneel down too at a certain point because if Our Lady is going to, we would, she would probably do. Yeah. So, and so we, so we, you know, kind of close it the day off, um, giving it to Our Lady and you know giving her all the the good things of the day, the bad things of the day, and asking her to make them, you know, into roses. <laughs> um, <laughs> all of them. Yeah, all. You make it all better. <laughs> um, 
And then also, <laughs> we also sing a, a, a antiphon to St. Dominic, too, at the end of the day. Oh, and then, then we go into silence. So that's okay. usually around, like, eight or so. And then, and so, and then we're in silence, and, and at a certain point, it's called profound silence. So, so we go into a deeper silence that we wouldn't break until the Angelus the next morning. So. Wow. Yeah. Um, right. I, I feel so honored to hear about the, the, the movement of your day. It's yeah. just really beautiful. It's very personal. Mm-hmm. Personal to the order, but personal to your life here, too. Thank you for sharing that. Well, for all the women who want to learn more, who want to know more, who think these ladies have got something good going on, because you do, where can they find out more? And um, how can they kind of jump into this discernment and contacting, maybe, you know, the vocation instructor or just poking around on the internet? Where did they go? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You want me to talk about it? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we'll share. Um, so our, our website is sistersofmary.org, and um, our, our, we have a wonderful vocation instructor named Sister mm-hmm. Joseph Andrew, who's probably led like thousands of, wow. of young women and young men um, to their vocation. And she is incredible and has an enormous amount of wisdom. And she will, um, she will not let you um, beat around the bush or anything. I mean, she she's very very direct and, and has a really good sense of people. Um, and so don't be afraid to, to email her. Um, so sisters, I would say if really really serious to contact sisters Andrew directly. Uh, we also right now because of COVID we have some virtual retreats that have been very good. I mean, people have really enjoyed, even though it's virtual and everything, there's, there's, I think there's even some perks to it that I think they've kind of seen a greater variety maybe of um, talks and, and things like that. Um, but we do hope next year to be going back to regular retreats at our mother house. And so that really is how, that's really how you have to do it. I mean, you know, like, like Nella was saying, you can, you can only, you know, kind of daydream so much about this sort of stuff. You actually really have to go out and, and meet communities and ask questions. And that's how you'll really know. Um, that's how you'll have some clarity. That's how people can give you some direction too. That's how you kind of get a sense too of, of different charisms. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. Um, it's not as, um, it's not like a commitment. Like you're not, you know, it's, it's not as scary as it might seem. I also would encourage young women, especially, you know, of, of this generation too, to really, you know, sit back and think about the ways that the culture has impacted maybe your discernment. And, um, you know, there's such a fear right now of making a commitment. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a fear that, that if not every, if, uh, not all my little ducks are in a row, mm-hmm. that I can't make a choice. Um, there's even kind of a growing apathy about direction in life um, or a sense that I'm too young or something like that. Um, you know, you're called to something, you're called to something now. And if God is asking of you now, you need to go out and meet him mm-hmm. and, and do it and uh, put aside some of these fears and the ways that the culture has, has shaped you into, into being very fearful and, and also fearful of commitment. You're, you're, you have to make a commitment at a certain point in your life to really develop maturity, and um, whether that's in marriage or that's in religious life or whatever. So um, don't be afraid of that. And also don't be afraid to, to seek help for uh, for real personal struggles too, mm. um, that's that's something you know that kind of personal healing um, is is so so necessary. We all have huge wounds, yeah. um, but there's a certain amount of, of healing that also has to happen before somebody mm. can say can really make a yes. And that's and that's for a lot of um, for all vocations. And so um, if there's something you're really really struggling with, um, to seek to seek real help for that. So that would be my advice. I just I just want to add on to sister with the retreats um to like it's not signing a commitment you don't have you know you're not signing your life away just by right. showing up right but just like the whole point is to encounter religious life personally um but then also to like make space for god to talk to you mm-hmm. because to take time away from your exactly. life yeah. go there physically exactly you are physically there exactly to, to be able to and yeah. there are, i mean sisters of andrew tells great stories about how young women who have come and who have given that space for God to speak to them and they've had the freedom to say you know I'm not called a religious life I think mm-hmm. I know now I'm called a marriage I know mm-hmm. and like they're just full of joy when they leave not because they just spent a weekend at a convent and now they're <laughs> not gonna even think about that again but it's just the joy of knowing I asked God to speak to me he's spoken to me and now I know yeah so oh I love yeah. that that's so beautiful and to know that uh to hear your stories to know that 
um, women who are very normal, who've led, you know, lots of, lots of different things going on in them, baton twirling, thespianism, singing, that, that God's calling all of us in a certain way toward him. And whether it's through the religious community, specifically through a different vocation, we're all called to be intimate with him. It just kind of depends on what variety you know, he's going to call us to, isn't it? Ladies, thank you so much for being part of this. And sisters, thank you for your time today. Thank you. What a joy to have another come and see. And please, put your questions in there. We will answer them. We will get back to you. And, and what a blessing. Sister, would you lead us in prayer? To oh, close? sure. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless uh, Nell and all the young women that are watching this currently. Um, help them to be attentive to the ways that he that you are trying to love them and be attentive to the ways that you are trying to speak to them. Help them know how much you love them and know that you are walking right there with them, um, ready to catch them when they fall, ready to help them up and ready to keep guiding them and that you will never leave, leave them just as you are present to us. Your son is present to us in the Eucharist. And we ask you to bless all those who are suffering right now in any way. We ask you to, to bless all those who are um, all those who are watching this. And we ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Lady Hail Mary, full of grace, grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother 